Yeah. We hear you just fine. Can you hear us? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so um, we'd like to get it's one uh, thirty-one, and if we can go ahead uh, with the meeting, I'd like to call the meeting to order and um, welcome everybody to the quarterly uh, health insurance exchange meeting. I mean monthly. Sorry. In my dreams. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Gilbert, if you could take the roll. I will. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Ms. Smith Campbell is not present. Ms. Atkins? Here. Ms. Johnstone? Absent. Ms. Lewis? Here. Dr. Jameson? Present. Ms. Kerr? On the phone. Thank you. And Dr. Ford? Here. Mr. Gilliland? Here. Uh, Mr. Kipper? Here. And Ms. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. And I think if we can get the mics, um, the volumes a little bit uh, louder, it would be great. And with that, obviously, um, the chair is uh, not here today, so that's why I'm chairing the meeting. And uh, with that, we will start with public comment. Is there any public comment in the north? We do have public comment in the north. Good afternoon. I am here. Uh, my name is Mike Stasco. I'm with H Center, a uh, software company based out of Reston, Virginia. And I'm here a way of introduction. Uh, H Center, as you were aware, on the recent uh, rescinded uh, uh, RFP, uh, did team up with Optum in, in, our, uh, in our first attempt. Um, we would like to uh, continue the dialogue as uh, the process evolves through this next year. Uh, HCENF is the leading uh, software uh, developer for state exchanges. As you know, we have uh, now over 1.7 million enrollees have come through an HCENF system. We, we're involved uh, in New York, Colorado, Kentucky. Uh, we're set for Illinois, and probably more important for uh, Nevada is the fact that we've, we've also been picked up by Massachusetts as a cost-effective solution for their second, their second attempt at, uh, at going live. And then most recently, HCENF will be the product, uh, and we're very, very engaged right now, uh, for SHOP on the federal SHOP program. So we're very excited to be a part of SHOP, which will reach 36 states uh, beginning here, uh, like all of us, on November the 15th. So uh, I'd like to be uh, noted in, in, uh, in your documentation. I've provided my information, I will with Tyler, uh, and also with Damon, and uh, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity uh, for H to to continue the discussion on our product and our solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any additional public comment in the north? There is none. Any public comment in the south? There is not. So with that, we'll close public comment. And if we can go to agenda item three, approval of the minutes for the September 11th, 2014 board meeting. Those have been provided for um, on the uh, 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 materials. Um, are there any comments or additions or corrections to the minutes? If none, is there a motion? I'm a approval of the minutes of September 11th. There's, is there a second? I second the motion. Lawrence Jameson. All in favor? Aye. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All right. The minutes have been approved. And if we can go to agenda item four for Mr. Gilbert's report. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, members of the board. This is perhaps the most interesting month that I have had in my short tenure uh, as your executive director. So much is going on and so many things are happening as we point toward uh, open enrollment, which as everyone knows begins next month. 
Um, looking forward toward uh, the 2015 open enrollment, um, there's no question but that we face challenges. When you think about the transition from the Xerox system to essentially the healthcare.gov platform, um, there's an awful lot of work to be done, an awful lot of I's to be dotted, T's to be crossed. Um, the nice thing that I would share is that we do not face those challenges alone. Um, this transition has led, I believe, to a closer partnership with other state agencies. We've worked uh, very closely um, uh, with, uh, with Romaine and with Scott and with others uh, to try and make certain that there's no potential problem that is overlooked. Um, everything is checked, rechecked, and I believe, based on what I have seen, and from a project management perspective, that we are building a uh, solid foundation for success in the upcoming open enrollment. Um, I talk a lot when I speak about building a foundation for success, and oftentimes I'm asked what that means. Um, how will we know if our efforts have been successful and what kind of metrics or benchmarks should we use to determine uh, whether this is a positive and successful open enrollment experience? Um, generally speaking, when, when, when I discuss this, people ask me for a number. And what I would say is I don't guess at numbers. It's counterproductive. Even if you're right, you're generally wrong. Um, and I know people like to tie success to the number of people who enroll through the exchange, but I would share with the board my opinion that that number is a byproduct and really simply a reflection of the quality of the user experience that's provided by the exchange. So if our pre-screener works properly and people are more quickly directed to the appropriate enrollment site, whether it's healthcare.gov, or Access Nevada, then we will have been successful. And if choosing a plan is easier and completing the enrollment process is simpler, then we will have been successful. And if enrollees are appropriately billed and payments are properly credited and coverage is timely extended, then we will have been successful. We are doing everything that we can in order to make sure that that's exactly what happens. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the design and functionality of the website or our interface with healthcare.gov, um, or the way that we present information over the course of our campaign uh, in terms of communicating uh, the open enrollment uh, to the public. I really think that we're doing a very, very, very fine job. And I, I, am, I, I would share with you that I'm very pleased with the efforts of staff particularly. I think that they have done yeoman's work. You know, it's interesting because there, there were some articles that appeared today um, in the national media that talked specifically about some of the things that I just touched on uh, in terms of the changes to the healthcare.gov website uh, and the efforts that are being made to improve the user experience. For example, one of the things that they have brought forward is a shorter application form. They have reduced the number of, of web pages, if you will, for most users, for 70% of the users, from 76 to 16. That's a significant shortening of time and will make the process flow much simpler. Additionally, and I think that this is very important, verification steps will be held until the completion of the application process and then sent out, as opposed to verification being sent out after every single one of those 76 pages previously. So you can imagine the impact that those sort of changes are going to have. Um, I will share with you what I, what I share with everybody, which is, I certainly don't expect this, the uh, open enrollment to be flawless. I know that we will have problems. I know that, that issues will arise. But I will tell you, from my perspective, I am very pleased with what I have seen. I've been very pleased with the reception of, of the agent and broker community as I've gone forward and talked about what this coming open enrollment is going to look like. And I am very optimistic that in November, we will be able to offer a better and certainly a more successful open enrollment experience for Nevada's consumers. And that would be the sum and substance of my report. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Are there any questions on the executive director's report? Well, I have one question. I'm going to, um, I'm going to pretend I'm Ms. Johnstone because I think she usually asks this question. So I'll ask it this month though. Um, what, what's keep, what's keeping you up at night though? Um, is there anything particular keeping you up at night? Any challenges that we um, that are on the horizon? Um, I, I think you know, if there's any if there's any of those, we'd love to hear them. So, so, so what, what you're really asking me, I think, is 
is where does the greatest risk lie? If something's going to go bad, where's it going to go bad? And from my perspective, it's in those things that we can't control and don't control. Uh, the timetables that are set by CMS, shifting deadlines, uh, uh, shifting uh, timetables. For example, end-to-end uh, -end testing was to have begun on September 22nd for our carrier partners on the exchange. And it was ahead of the testing, the end-to-end -end testing, that would be provided to carriers as a whole throughout the nation in all of the states that utilize the uh, federal infrastructure. That didn't happen. We got bumped. We got bumped to October 7th. And as a consequence, we lost some time that might have allowed us more quickly to identify a flaw or, or a, a potential issue. So what I, what I worry about, honestly, are the things that we cannot control. When it comes to the planning aspects of it and when it comes to the, to the operational side that, that we deal with, when it comes to, to interacting um, um, with, with Romain and his staff or, or with Scott and others, I don't lose sleep over that. I feel really good about that. Um, do I worry that, that CMS is going to turn around to me tomorrow and say uh, something that, that I will find difficult? Sure I do. Um, but I think if there is a risk, if there's a significant risk, that's really where the risk lies. We have, I think, over the course of, of months, and, and I would give particular thanks to Steve Fisher um, and his efforts on behalf of, of oversight of this project and moving it forward. We have done everything that we can to identify risks and mitigate them. And uh, uh, we meet, frankly, every Monday and spend an hour plus talking about what we saw last week, what we see this week, whether we've made progress on any particular issue, whether there are things that still vex us. Um, most of the uh, it, most of the timelines that we look at are yellow rather than green, but they're not red, which is what's the important thing. So, so what keeps me up at night and what I worry most about are the things that we can't control. Thank you. Um, there's no other question. Any questions up north? All right, with that, we will close agenda item four and agenda item five is discussion of open enrollment for plan year 2015 and a verbal report. And uh, Mr. Gilbert, who will be giving us that? So uh, Damon Haycock for the record. Um, what I would like to do is tie this report into the uh, agenda item number six for the SSBM transition. I, I don't want to repeat too many pieces of information that are going to be redundant in that next report if, if that pleases the board. And then if there are any additional questions that I may not have answers for or have not answered, the full staff is here to provide that information. That's fine with me, Mr. Belcourt. Is there a problem with that? No, uh, that's fine. So, so with the board's permission, if we close agenda item five, I'll move to item six. That's fine. So item six is the supported state-based marketplace transition update. Uh, you'll notice that the format has changed significantly. I, I didn't want to put a, a, an immense amount of information that you've seen before. I wanted to keep it uh, concise to the point and hopefully address questions before they're answered. Again, at the end, I'll be more than willing to answer uh, any questions. And at the end of this report, I believe KPS 3 is going to provide an update as part of this, this report on the landing page. So with a, for, without further ado, uh, the, on page 2 of 3, you'll see a status of the SSBM transition. And I started out with the actual calendar of events. These are those critical milestones that everyone should be aware of. Uh, as you'll see, the very first one is end-to-end -end testing began uh, on 10-7 or on Monday. Uh, next, of course, QHPs will be certified uh, by the Division of Insurance on the 10th, which is tomorrow. Our exchange testing on-site with carriers is next week. We will be sending staff to Las Vegas and to Reno to sit down and buddy up with our carrier counterparts. Not all of them, but, but as many as we could, we could muster so we could physically have eyes on the process as to validate and verify the end-to-end -end testing is successful. Uh, we, we, we are not deluding ourselves into thinking we'll see everything at this exact point in time because testing is still ongoing, but we are going to do everything we can to assist the carriers in this process. 
The approved 2015 rates uh, are will be posted by the Division of Insurance per uh, statute on October 16th. We will be relaunching, as we've mentioned before, the NevadaHealthLink.com landing page website on November 3rd. Access Nevada is scheduled to be relaunched on November 10th, and of course, open enrollment begins on November 15th. The most critical part of open enrollment for current exchange enrollees is November 15th through December 15th, that 30-day critical window so that they can continue to receive subsidized coverage through the either the same carrier or re-enroll or excuse me, or enroll with a new carrier. And then plan year 2015 begins on January 1 and open enrollment ends February 15th. So that's those are the critical milestone dates in a nutshell. To briefly go over the various uh, areas of this transition, carrier onboarding, carriers have successfully completed a, a lot of their testing in preparation for end-to-end -end boundary and the EDI, that testing that CMS provides where they send uh, an enrollment file to the carriers to ensure that they can receive it and absorb it. In return, the carriers send back the uh, enrollment file that states that they have, for lack of better terms, received payment and are effectuating that enrollment. So I won't get into too much of the weeds unless you have questions later. Plan certification, the DOI has successfully transferred all QHP data to the hub. So this is a wonderful thing. We have a total of 155 plans that have been successfully uploaded for Nevada. Uh, as mentioned earlier, with the brokers and agents, uh, they are required to take training. And as of our latest reports from CMS, 326 brokers and agents have successfully completed all requirements. We are continuing to send out correspondence to ensure all those that want to participate have all the resources they need to be successful. As far as exchange enrollment facilitators, they too will have to take the federal training and they have been able to uh, to register and attend the 20-hour training to utilize healthcare.gov. We've received reports that many are getting through it today. Uh, we anticipate all navigators and enrollment assisters will be approved to assist Nevadans prior to uh, the kickoff on November 15th. Medicaid and Nevada checkup. Medicaid has had, uh, or excuse me, welfare that oversees this process has had a lot of effort and a lot of tasks in the last uh, last month. They are currently participating in user acceptance testing. Uh, this is really critical for all of their products to ensure that once they launch on November 10th that the user experience is appropriate and that everything points to where it's supposed to and all of the systems work appropriately. Uh, later this month, they're going to have performance and stress testing to ensure that they can uh, that they are not overloaded when they come online. And then finally, the new NevadaHealthLink.com, of course, as I mentioned, will be relaunching on November 3rd. The initial designs have been developed and approved. There are forms that are currently on our website available for brokers and for our EEFs to sign up to have their information displayed on the uh, upcoming broker and EEF lookup tool. Additionally, organizations who wish to be certified as certified application organizations now have the ability to fill out a form online so that the exchange can approve them and to send their information to CMS so they too can be included in that critical navigator training for healthcare.gov. And with that, I believe I see the back head of Katie Coleman at KPS3. I think so. Can't tell. And I'm going to, there it is. And I'm going to turn this over to her to discuss the designs and to go over their progress, as you'll see in attachment A. Um, Damon, I think what we'd like to do is, um, I think there's a couple of questions on your uh, the part of your report. If we can do that before we turn it over to KPS3. Not a problem. Um, Second. Um, Dr. Ford? Hi, Dr. Ford, for the record. Could you um, comment on the total of 155 plans that have been successfully uploaded? Both Dr. Jamison and I went, ooh. Um, so do I. So that seems like a really big number. Could you make? Could you kind of break that down a little bit? So and and I, my question was my question it was about the same because I know we had taught we had um, limited five plans per carrier right. per tier and so I, we'd love to kind of have a little bit more detail on that. So for the record, Damon Haycock, those 155 plans are not going to be displayed all at once in any service area. We're not intending to, nor do we ever have a desire to overload the consumer experience by presenting way too many uh, choices. So that is the sum total of plans, and those include plans that, that have special circumstances. So there are multi-state plans involved in that process. There are plans segregated by uh, service area and or rating area. Uh, there's also uh, plans by tier, and we have collectively five medical qualified health plan carriers that are participating on the exchange, 
and 10 standalone dental plan carriers. Some are subsidiaries of others, but that is the reporting that we are getting from CMS. So with 15 carriers and 155 plans in four different service areas, the 155 number doesn't seem so dark. All 10 is dental. Yeah. Does that, does that help answer your question? Five medical variations within these. Yeah, is there is there a is there more detail that that you could send to the board on these plans and for the medical carriers. for the medical carriers, not for the dental? I think that this is sounding. I think we're still a little confused um, on the numbers and whether there's a bunch of variations that maybe. Uh, I, I think we need more a little more information on this. Uh, yes, Ms. Atkins, uh, if you'd like, I can. I can get with the Division of Insurance and get a very quick and easy down and dirty break at, breakdown as to how many plans are were submitted in a, and sent over per carrier uh, to include a, a highlight for the, the medical carriers, and you'll see how it's split out over the rating areas. Florence Jameson, for the record, uh, did the number of plans uh, per carrier or just overall actually change significantly compared to last year to this year? That's a very good question, Dr. Jameson. I know that with the new entry time insurance, all of those plans are new to the exchange. Uh, but uh, I don't know that answer, and we'll find that out and add that to the piece we sent to you guys after this. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Haycock up north? Ms. Kerr, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, turn it over. Great. Um, KBS3, uh, Katie Coleman for the record. Um, so as David mentioned, the new NevadaHealthLink.com will launch on November 3rd. Uh, the new website will direct customers to that very important pre-screener tool. In addition to providing other helpful links, tools, and resources that consumers will use to obtain assistance in enrolling in income-based coverage through Nevada HealthLink. So the purpose of this report is really to, um, uh, there's a list here of uh, the key features, wanted to recap those for you, but more importantly, review with you guys the, uh, the findings from our usability testing. Um, we've uh, reviewed those uh, findings and uh, we've made some adjustments to the design um, and wanted to uh, review those with you today. So um, I've listed here the uh, recap of the key features. Um, you guys can all read those at your convenience. If there's any questions about those uh, key features, I'm happy to uh, answer those. Um, but I'm gonna move into the usability and eye tracking testing process and objective section. So our testing was conducted on September 25th and 26th. Uh, we had 30 participants, 20 who were English speaking, 10 who were Spanish speaking. They were from the ages of 18 to 64 all uninsured uh, Nevada residents, of course, and a 50-50 split between men and women within our federal poverty levels. And so what are the objectives of uh, usability and eye tracking tests? Um, well, first of all, we do a visual analysis of both the sites, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, we ask questions that, you know, we want to know what elements drive attention, um, where do these participants navigate, is it easy for them to do so and complete designated tasks that we ask them to complete, Ultimately, we want to uncover strengths, weaknesses, elements that are not working, um, and, and certainly we wanted to test the ease of navigation to that very important pre-screener tool, the Get Help page, the Manage Your Plan page, and then uncover any obstacles in them doing so. So uh, I'm going to review the findings and some of the next steps that we are taking based on these findings. So the most liked elements, uh, our users uh, mentioned that it is a professional site they liked the simplicity of the website design. Uh, they liked the happy, natural, and diverse photos that were presented on the homepage, and really appreciated the variety of information and help options available. Now, certainly we don't test things just to get compliments. We actually want to know what the challenges are. So we've identified um, some key elements for improvement. Uh, we want to make some navigation and design adjustments to ensure our consumers don't scroll for more information. Uh, our users told us that they want some more photos that represent single people, um, including single parents, and then also of Hispanics. Uh, they wanted a more prominent date for that open enrollment period, a more prominent what's new section to advise of the new process, and then a, a better toggle button between the English and Spanish sites so that it's very clear how to get from one to the other. Some additional key insights. 
Uh, the maju majority of our participants knew where to manage current plans. That was 100%. Uh, the majority knew where to find in-person assistance. Again, 100% of our users knew how to navigate to that. Uh, the majority knew where to re-enroll at 96%. The majority knew where to start a new plan at 90%. The majority knew how to navigate directly to healthcare.gov at 66% and Access Nevada, 63%. Again, those are direct links to those, those uh, resources, not through the pre-screener tool. And I can explain that a little bit more if needed. Um, we also asked those, how does, this, how does this site make you feel? We gave them um, some, some sample words and, and wanted to get to know uh, what, what it made them feel like. Our English participants uh, said curious, knowledgeable, helped, and relieved. And our Spanish participants said knowledgeable, helped, curious, and inspired. So once we take these findings, we really want to make sure that we're making adjustments. Um, the design has been adjusted, uh, adjusted um, to ensure that consumers know to scroll for more information, that they know when the dates are for open enrollment, they know what's new about Nevada Health Link and the new process, that they can easily toggle between the two language sites, and that our photos are diverse and represent as many of our citizens as possible. We will continue to um, make adjustments to that. Um, I'm moving on to page three. This is a, a, a real nice view of uh, some graphs um, that both include the English and Spanish participants. And we asked them on a scale of one to five, one being poor and five being excellent, um, to rate the website on the following. Professionalism, color scheme, helpfulness, and overall. And as you can see, uh, the, the charts are, uh, are trending where we want them to, um, mostly in the fours and fives. And on the final page, uh, we wanted to show a, a screenshot, a snapshot of what those adjustments look like to the homepage. You'll see that we've added uh, the 2015 open enrollment uh, date clear at the top with a little clock up there to indicate time. Uh, there's a small icon to indicate that you can scroll down the little arrows beneath that mouse sort of icon, actually going to blink a little bit to make sure folks know to continue to scroll. Uh, we have added a learn how it works button in that third section. We have added the what's new section to ensure folks know what uh, is new for the upcoming open enrollment cycle. And uh, we've also made some adjustments on the Spanish side with the um, Spanish toggle button. So with that, I can answer any questions. Doctor? This is Dr. Ford for the record. So um, I just went to see what the website looks like now. And when I put in Nevada Health Link into my search, we're the third thing that comes up. Why, why would that be? How does that work? In Google Analytics? Or um, in, in Google? It happens to be Yahoo. It's Yahoo. So why would we be the third thing that comes up on our, when I put Nevada Health Link? How does that Nevada work? Nevada Health Link. So that's based on a, a variety of factors. And I, I really want to get you the, the accurate answer. But more or less, it's based on what's on our site, what people are searching for. And it's kind of this algorithm of how things appear on a search, on a search list. Now, if you uh, if we do some optimization, which which we haven't because we've been so close to the top as far as search goes, um, but if we did do some optimization, that's how you can move up and down that list. And I'd be happy to follow up with some additional details about um, how that works. So this is Dr. Ford again. Um, so there's a plan for optimization. We have not done um, search engine optimization for Nevada Health Link to date. Lawrence Jameson, but as you said, virtually 100% of people had no trouble finding it. So, uh, Katie Coleman, for the record, uh, let me clarify. This was based on the design that we presented to them for the new NevadaHealthLink.com. So they were already technically yeah. there. Yeah. And it's not a live site anyway. We showed them views of a, of a fake site, essentially, a, a staged site, so that we could really understand how our design is working with them. But um, this isn't based on a test for someone to be able to search for it um, through through a browser, if you will, and see if they can get there. Lynn Atkins, for the record, um, remind me on the homepage, if people are looking for brokers or agents or navigators, where are they going to click? Because I'm kind of not sure where I would click. Yeah. So um, on the new NevadaHealthLink.com, I believe it's the third in the middle icon that says Get Help. Okay. It'll take them to a whole page that not only has our zip code-based search tool, which is one of the best tools uh, we will have for people trying to find a broker. You can 
type in your zip code and up will pop a, a Google map actually. Um, in that list there will also be uh, important phone numbers, other links to our navigator and sister sites, um, calendars, etc. So it's kind of a, a warehouse of all places you can get help through Nevada Health Link. So my thought at least on that get help narrative, the, the, the words there, there should be something like assistance or, or something that people would know if they need that, that it's not just information, but it might also be assistance. So if they're looking, like I said, for a broker or an agent or a navigator, I think that just the description doesn't suggest to me that somebody might actually help me fill up, uh, apply for health insurance. So I, I think that okay. if that could be cleared up, that would be great. Great. Madam Chair, this is Tyler Clemens. May I add to that? Please. All right, um, again, for the record, this is Senator Clemens. I think it's also important to note that when you scroll down, the screenshot you're seeing on this page, there is a, a brokers and agents. Um, uh, I believe it's green, right, Katie? There's a whole section under what's new that has brokers. So it's as you scroll down, there's also an opportunity to, to select a broker and agent button specifically on, on the home page per se. Any other questions from board members up in the north? This has remained on the line for the record. And on the one item that says majority knew where to start a new plan, what are you doing to address the 10% that did not know where to start? Record. Um, so what we do with, with these results, and, and we, we do consider 90% a, a very good result, but for that 10%, what we're able to do, and, and uh, I should have explained this a little bit more in the beginning of this, this test not only identifies where people clicked, it also tracked their eyeballs. It literally saw where they looked, where are they looking for information, each and every one of them, and that really helps us uh, deliver the content that they're looking for. So when we say we want you to start a new plan, uh, the 90, 90% who, yay, you did, you did what we thought you would do and clicked on start enrollment, good job. The 10%, we will see where, where the eyeballs went. And we make sure that that content is also where they went to look for, look, look for those, um, that, that kind of action that they needed to take, that we asked them to take. And it really helps us get the content in the right places so that we know, okay, you know, five out of the 30 people, when we ask them about X, they went here. That tells us we should also have that content there to make sure that the right nuggets of information are sprinkled throughout the site. Thank you for the answer again. This is Romain Gilliland for the record. So I guess I, I get, have one additional follow-up question. Since the measurement of success is going to be the people who are accessing the plan, have you set a threshold for what would be an acceptable level for measurement of success in, again, this very important element of where to start a new plan? Katie Coleman, for the record, we have not. I think uh, Tyler Klimas and, and my group will need to sit down and identify what that looks like as we get through uh, development and into launch. Be happy to discuss that with the public exchange staff. Thank you. Any other questions from any of the board members? Anyone up north? All right, I'm oh, sorry. go ahead, Dr. Ford. Sorry. I have one more question. Will you be doing, this is Dr. Ford again. Um, will you be doing another analysis once this is launched of the eyeballs? Um, this is Katie Coleman for the record. We do not have plans for that, uh, but we, um, we could do it in a live environment. We could set this up at a certain point once we get things launched and uh, tested again there. One thing we, we do want to make sure we're doing before launch is not making any major navigational changes. Um, that's that's something that really kind of when you build a website, we need to make sure that the navigation and the architecture is, is really where it needs to be. But as far as content goes, um, we could certainly do that, really make sure the content is in the right places where people are really going. Also in our analytics. So we run full analytics on this website um, to see where people came from, where they went within our site, where they, where they, you know, what point did they leave? Did they go into healthcare.gov? Did they go into uh, the DWSS site? Um, did they go into, you know, Amazon? We can figure out where they left and what their path looked like in there and really make some adjustments in there. So um, we really leverage analytics for those, those kinds of things as well. 
Any other questions? With that, thank you very much. And we will close agenda item six and move to agenda item seven. Thank you, Carrie Eaton for the record. Uh, during the first quarter year, quarter of state fiscal year 15, um, I'm going Carrie, to provide- Carrie, excuse me, we're, we're having a really hard time hearing here, so I don't know if it's the mic or the sound or if someone can- He's working on it. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. All right, Carrie Eaton for the record. I'm going to give you an update on the financial report uh, for the quarter ending September 30th, 2014. And this was the first quarter of state fiscal year 15. And staff has been busy preparing budgetary documents to close out the previous fiscal year, open up the current fiscal year, and prepare the biennial budget for the next two upcoming fiscal years. Um, as you already know, we still have four work programs that transfer federal grant authority from our remaining grants to our current fiscal year, and those will be reviewed at the Interim Finance Committee coming up on October 22nd. And after reviewing the decisions of that meeting, staff will be able to come back to the board with the first look at the actual revenue and expenditure authority um, that's available to the exchange for the current fiscal year. Additionally, uh, we just got word yesterday that requests uh, that had been sent out for no-cost extensions for our federal grants to extend them out through um, calendar year 15 have been approved. So three of our federal grants are now going through state uh, calendar year 2015. And to be clear, that is only for um, DD&I DD expenses. And with that, I will turn it over to Tyler for the marketing and outreach update. Tyler Klimas, for the record, I'll discuss the uh, marketing and outreach report is what it's called. This is basically going to be a recap as we've delivered these plans. Uh, it'll, it'll more be a refresher for the board. Um, real quick, um, the campaign concepts and the messaging. Tyler, can we, I'm sorry, we're having trouble hearing you, Tyler. <laughs> is this better? Not really. Nick, is this better? Yeah. Yes, if you can okay. hold the microphone closer. Lovely, right. thank you. Okay. So the campaign concepts, messaging, and the media mix recommendations were presented to the, uh, the board on September 11th, last board meeting. Um, I'd like to highlight just four uh, milestones on the timeline, uh, one being today, which is was the website design that you, you, you just heard the presentation from Katie at KPS3. Uh, November 3rd, as we've, we've talked about here, is the launch of the new NevadaHealthLink.com. Um, for the media, November 5th, our digital and out-of-home media will launch. And then on November 15th, uh, our broadcast and print media uh, will launch. Um, the other I I'd like to touch on is the re-enrollment campaign. As you know, we've had a lot of discussion about that. Uh, we're doing direct emails and direct letters to yes. current enrollees. Uh, I I think there's some good news coming out. Uh, the first launch, the emails went out on October 2nd. Um, happy to report out of the, the enrollees who received the email, over 13,000 uh, were opened. So that is an open rate of, of 33%, and, and that's simply on the first go around. Uh, I, I think that is, is very good news. Uh, we're talking about education and awareness. Um, those numbers aren't likely to change. The emails, you know, once it sits in your inbox, it goes stale after about 72 hours. So, so we can be confident that 33% was the success rate on the first go around. Again, this will be one of a series of emails um, that will continue through the open enrollment period. Um, I believe the next, the following Monday, so this Monday, the letters went out, and uh, we'll be happy to report on on any statistics we can we can draw from from that campaign uh, at the next board meeting. The new Nevada Health Link website I listed here, I, I do not believe I, I need to go through that as you just um, saw the changes that, that we've made and um, the tools that we have. Beyond that is the, the outreach. Um, of course, this period will focus on uh, person-to-person -person assistance, 
Um, we're going to concentrate our resources on the enrollment stores and then strategic outreach uh, events and, and distribution points, uh, much like we did last year. Uh, just to highlight a couple that are coming up, um, the Springs Preserve, the, the Haunted Harvest, uh, that's throughout the month of October. Nevada Health Link will have a presence there. Um, obviously, uh, as we lead up to the open enrollment period, this will be a, an education-style campaign. Uh, we'll be at the Diabetes Fair in Las Vegas, as well as the, the Veterans Day Music Festival in Reno. Uh, just to highlight a, a couple of uh, past events, we, we recently were at the at Reach's uh, VDS health event, and uh, as well as the Governor's Conference on Small Business, which I also attended, and, and we had a lot of people come up to the booth. We were able to educate them and speak with them, and, and you know, those are invaluable uh, efforts for, for our outreach and education uh, leading up to open enrollment. So with that, uh, I'll pass it back to Carrie. Can, um, I have a, one question. I don't know if there's any other questions, if we can um, have questions for you, Tyler. Can you give a little bit more update on the enrollment stores and what the status is of those? I can, and, 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 and Katie, be prepared. Uh, I will also call on, on you for this. But as I understand it, we have um, secured at least one location in the south and one location in the north. Um, we plan on having at least one more location uh, in the south. Uh, they will be open seven days a week. Uh, they will be static locations. Uh, they'll be staffed uh, administratively by KPS3 and uh, uh, as well as a presence by our navigator organizations and then, of course, uh, agents and brokers. Uh, I'd also like to add that welfare staff will also uh, have agreed to, to be a part of that, which is, is, is a big help. If I could answer any more questions on that, I'd be happy to. No, that answers that for me. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions for Tyler for his section of the report? Um, Lawrence Jameson, I was just uh, wondering, uh, that's great. You've already been to quite a few events. and with events being pretty much scheduled well well ahead of time, probably a majority of the events that you plan to attend over the enrollment period are probably set. And I wondered in the ballpark how many of them you would be attending. And also with regard to how we found the health fair or the, at, the, at the end of last session so successful, have you scheduled one, two, or three of those? You know what, the fact that Katie is right there, I'm going to let her answer that. The, the answer is, is yes, we certainly have a plan. It will be changing. Um, and this also, it's worth mentioning that the, you know, there's a current community calendar set up on the info page right now, but the bread and butter will, will most certainly be the, the Get Help calendar, uh, the calendar that will live on, on the Get Help section of the new Nevada Health Link, which launches November 3rd. Um, but, uh, Katie, if you want to talk about some of the outreach events that we have planned. Sure, absolutely. And um, we actually are, are pacing ourselves um, accordingly based on when open enrollment starts. So we've done um, a handful of events leading up until open enrollment. One, to make sure folks know what's happening on November 15th, but also to get some of that re-enrollment messaging out there. So that's been a really good opportunity to spread the word. Um, we've had about every other weekend um, kind of cadence over uh, the last uh, month or so, and in addition to moving up until November 15th. Once we get into open enrollment, we have uh, virtually weekly um, events, uh, pretty much. There are some uh, events that are larger than others, so we kind of have to uh, pace ourselves accordingly. In addition to those outreach events, they're uh, informational based. We hand out information. We certainly are going to be handing out information about our stores, how to make appointments, um, those types of things. In addition to those outreach events, there are certainly larger, um, large scale uh, enrollment events slated for the first part of open enrollment throughout the middle and then at the end um, for one big push. Those will be happening in the north and the south. And uh, KPS3 will be partnering with um, our uh, navigator uh, organizations in addition to our brokers and agents um, throughout the state on those. So uh, there's a lot planned. And um, as far as the cadence go, that's kind of how we're looking. So, and Florence Jameson, uh, for the record, and the, the store, exactly what will be available there? I, I know you'll have 
someone to help with qualify health plans, and then uh, you said that uh, the Medicaid have offered to participate. So they're sending a person or. So Katie Coleman, for the record, yes, um, Medicaid has agreed to partner with us. Um, as far as how many people um, will be, be committed to that, that's something that we have to work with them on. Um, we're going to uh, learn a lot as we open these stores. We know that Saturdays are going to be pretty busy. Uh, we know that Monday mornings may not be, and um, so we're going to have to plan accordingly. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, Connecticut the Connecticut Exchange actually opened these stores. And this is where uh, we got a, a lot of our ideas. And um, I actually had a call with the executive or, or the marketing director in Connecticut, and he talked about how flexible they had to be. When they opened, they thought, okay, here's our hours. And they really had to do a lot of adjusting. So we know that we're going to have to do that as well. And so all of our partners, including Medicaid and our navigators and our brokers and agents, um, are going to be uh, on that ride with us as we uh, schedule things and, and adjust throughout the schedules or, or throughout the enrollment cycle. So um, I don't know how many will be in there every single day, uh, but we will ask for as much support as, as any organization can offer us. Florence Jameson, what I was uh, wondering specifically, you say, will, will they mostly be our staff or will you be inviting other people uh, that are volunteer, uh, enroll in their sisters? Will you be inviting brokers? Will you be inviting um, some of the other more organized entities to join you? Uh, and will you, your hours, as you mentioned, uh, Saturdays will be the really popular, but so would evenings. Are you planning to start with evening hours? So Katie Coleman, for the record, yes, we will be open in the evenings. And uh, yes, we will be inviting anyone who is certified to enroll someone in this state can be part of our enrollment stores. Honestly, it is more the merrier. We are going to have a very clear and organized system to ensure that we are inviting those who are certified and, and uh, cleared through the exchange to do so and participate. And two, we'll be uh, using a, a calendar, a scheduling tool um, to ensure that um, everybody can can get in there and assist people um, when they'd like to. Uh, so, anyone who'd like to help, it's more than welcome. And you said you already had a place in the south and the north. And do you know the location in the south here? Um, so we are this close um, to being able to re release that. Um, we want do want to be sure that we have um, ink on the paper, um, but uh, as soon as we do that, we will have um, information to spread throughout our enrollment uh, community and among the board. And then in the north, we are on the corner of McCarran and Longley, um, right down the street from the Meadowood Mall. I guess generally, are you going to be in Summerlin or North Las Vegas or, or um, Old Henderson? Generally. Generally. Central plus Henderson area is kind of where we're at at this point. Um, but there's more developing, so there'll be more to come. Well, I was certainly concerned about the landlords for the record. I was concerned about the place where were you going to be located. Uh, certainly, you know, it's all in this place, but it's not where you would probably find most of your right. eligible efforts. That's my own comments. Any other questions before we turn it back over to Carrie? The Madam Vice Chair, if I might, Scott Kipper, uh, for the record. The question I have is, is, is been touched on a little bit, but have we gotten from our uh, federal partners or any other national organization a list of best practices on the marketing pieces? In fact, I guess what I'm digging for is it, is is it, any suggestions beyond things like the enrollment stores that worked really well for other states that we could uh, duplicate or replicate here in Nevada to to uh, get that message out I any faster or any further? Tyler Klimas, for the record, and, and and absolutely, we're always looking for ways to improve what we do. And certainly on the marketing side, there are many articles and many studies done. And that's, you know, we use that as we search to find our target markets. I mean, it's it's no secret that Hispanics as well as Young Invincibles are a huge target for everybody nationwide. Um, the enrollment stores, you know, I, I'm not really sure, Katie, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you found that in Connecticut. I mean, I, I, I certainly didn't, but if there are, you know, 
specifics, Katie, that you have, reports that you've seen, that you've drawn from, please feel free to jump in. I don't know, Scott, if that helps. Well, it does, uh, for the record, Scott Kipper. I, and I, again, I just, it's certainly not, uh, and don't take it as an indictment of what we're doing or what we're not doing. I'm, my question sure, it purely is, have we been pushed information by the federal government or other entities as saying, hey, this worked, tr you might try it, rather than uh, an indictment of, of things that we've either done or didn't, haven't done. Yes, um, there are there are weekly CMS calls on consumer assistance where many states can join in and share best practices, and and we do participate in that. And this was Katie Colmer, for the record. One more thing to add to that. Um, there's another organization uh, that, that we participate in. is, is the NASHP organization, and I'm not even going to butcher the, the acronym. So, um, And uh, they have a weekly calls. They have this group called the Exchangers Group. It's a club of exchange people and uh, ma mainly marketing people at exchanges. And so um, uh, my, my firm and um, Tyler and CJ in the past um, did participate on those quite a bit. And so when I get cool things coming in, I kind of push them to Tyler and say, hey, we got to look at this, check this out. Um, so that's where a lot of our, our kind of nifty ideas come from. Um, the door to door last time around uh, was kind of a, a collaborated effort as, as all of the states planned um, to get the word out across the country. So um, that's a really cool resource and, and a lot of good people who um, bounce ideas off each other all the time. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, let's turn it back to Carrie. Thank you, Carrie Eaton. For the record, I'll continue on with the quality assurance activities for this quarter. Uh, there have been no significant changes in quality assurance activities since our last quarter <clears throat> due to the limitations of existing web, web portal and reporting mechanisms. The exchange currently has limited capabilities to monitor trending and other activities established in the quality assurance plan. During the last quarter, the focus of the QA staff has been largely p placed on case resolution and transition activities as related to the SSBM. There has been continued em emphasis on case resolution, and although there are roughly 2,000 existing open cases, staff has made significant process during the last quarter. The exchange has been working diligently with the carriers and Xerox to ensure that each issue and open case is resolved. The exchange has met with each of the carriers to identify and establish processes that have led to a more expeditious and effective resolution of these cases. <clears throat> The results of five goals of the strategic plan have not changed significantly since the last quarter, as you can see on page three and four of the report. And page five of the report shows an overview of the enrollment statistics as of September 27th. There have been a reduction in the enrollment, enrollment amounts, which are due to consumer non-payment. And there has been an increase since the reconcili reconciliation process has begun. And that will conclude the staff quarterly reports, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions up north? Nope. Uh, doesn't look like there's any questions down south, so we will um, close agenda item seven and move to agenda item eight, report on progress of the reconciliation. Madam Chair, for the record, Bruce Gilbert, um, uh, as you know, this uh, particular aspect of our operations is overseen by uh, Mr. Rouse. However, I will review the report as she's not able to be with us here today. Um, generally speaking, what we're looking at here are two particular types of reconciliations, the first having to do with enrollment figures and the second having to do uh, with accounting. Uh, Dealing first and specifically with the enrollment reconciliation, uh, this has to do with the number of open member cases and reconciling those persons who have purchased or believe they have purchased insurance against uh, the carrier's records and the carrier's membership uh, records. Um, we have been able to close out a significant number of these particular types of issues. Um, it's noted in the report, for example, that PCG has confirmed that it has closed 
523 cases as of October 1st. You know, the goal is and has been to have all of the backlog cases closed by November 30th and a process in place to effectively handle any incoming cases that would fall into this particular work stream. Um, PCG has also been acting on behalf of the exchange as a carrier liaison and working specifically with the carriers to identify enrollment issues and enrollment types of cases, uh, comparing that list against the list that's provided by uh, Xerox and working through that. If you take a look at the case metrics, which are at the bottom of page two, you will notice the uh, number of cases that have been worked on, the number that have been resolved, and the number that remain open, um, along with a carrier breakdown, which indicates which carrier is, is uh, dealing uh, with uh, these particular types of issues. So, but this deals specifically with enrollment issues and not financial issues. Might the board have any questions with respect to that portion of the report before I move forward? This is Lynn. I had just one question, and maybe it's just uh, um, maybe there is no reason. It's just um, like St. Mary's. It looks like over half got resolved. Whatever, my mouth's bad. What sixty percent got resolved? Um, and then HPM, a very small percentage. Is there a reason? Are there different people working on some of these, or there's different level of staffing? Or is there any rhyme or reason? Um, I, I think it has to do with the, the carriers and the process more than it does uh, a difference in level or a difference in staffing. Um, and I think it also has to do with the employees the, uh, 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 for each of the health plans. I think that's reflected to some degree in these numbers. Any other questions about the enrollment statistics? All right, continue on, Mr. Gilbert. Thank you. Uh, with respect to the processes which are in place, um, as, is, as is indicated, PCG uh, is acting as the carrier liaison. They have interviewed the four major carriers. They have created a standardized process for tracking the open cases until resolution. Um, each carrier, however, does have their own master reconciliation file by which they track as well. Um, it includes uh, consumer names and HICS IDs and a variety of other uh, information. Um, these, uh, these groups um, actively research the open cases. There are weekly meetings to move this forward. And one of the things that we've been trying to work very hard on, um, as it was noted as a, as a potential irritant in this particular aspect of our operations, uh, has been the improved communication between the exchange and Xerox and the carriers through the interchange of information, either through reports or through uh, telephone calls or meetings. Um, so the actual weekly standing call schedule is set out uh, for each of the carriers there. And then the next steps and goals for each of the carriers are also uh, set out. Uh, with respect to Anthem, we are hoping to close out the Anthem list by November the 15th uh, with the co-op the same date. Uh, HPN closed their list by the 30th of November and then St. Mary's again uh, by the 15th. So our expectation is that the bulk of these issues, um, essentially all of them, will be, re will be resolved probably within the next 45 to 60 days. <clears throat> and that leads me to the accounting reconciliation, unless the board has questions about that aspect of the report. Any questions about the next steps and goals section? Or I guess the processes, no. Nope. All right, continue, go ahead, thanks. Thank you, Bruce Gilbert for the record. Turning our attention to the accounting reconciliation, which is by far the more problematic of the two, we're talking the reconciliation of financial accounts. Uh, and basically what's happening here, as the board is aware and as we have discussed, is it is a line by line, essentially manual reconciliation. Um, and if you, although, the types of problems are set out here on the first page, and the actions that are taken are set out on the first page. I think the more appropriate place for the board to, to uh, turn its attention is the second page, uh, particularly the bottom where it talks about our results. And if you take a look at the, uh, at the uh, uh, graph or, or the information that's provided down at the bottom, 
uh, with respect to the number of consumer accounts or items for uh, for each of the four buckets, if you will, and the number of those items that are open as of July 31st and then August 31st and then September 30th, there are a couple of things that sort of jump out. Um, the, the first is that the short pay on binder invoice, the number of consumer accounts or items grew from 403 on July 31st to 437 on August 31st to 1,137 at September 31. Interestingly, though, the amount of money which these issues involve has declined significantly by over half. And so what that is telling us, I believe, is that we are identifying a greater number of mistakes as we move through our line-by-line -line reconciliation. However, the dollar amount attendant to those mistakes uh, becomes ever smaller. Um, so we're doing a good job of identifying issues. Um, cases are being dealt with, but, but we are also, uh, I think, getting a better handle on what's actually out there. And if you take a look at the short pay recurring premium section in there as well, which is certainly the more complicated or perhaps the most complicated of the issues to be dealt with. It's moved from 32.94 to 28.55 to 39.74 because of the increased uh, attention to this, to this particular aspect. And again, we're doing a very good job as we move through line by line of identifying additional issues. So the increase in those numbers is not a bad thing, not in my estimation. It's a good thing. It means that we're finding things that we need to find um, and that we need to deal with. The items in suspense mode and the unprocessed items are really fairly insignificant. So I would call the, the uh, board's attention to those first two areas that uh, I was speaking to. Um, I would also note for the board that we have recently added to staff positions in Henderson specifically to deal with these issues, as I indicated that I would when I came aboard in, in August. And uh, additionally, uh, 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 Shauna has indicated that she will be devoting the bulk of her time on a going forward basis to, to pushing these, these numbers down and getting them flattened out. So in addition to identifying uh, problems and issues which need to be identified, we brought additional resources to bear to, uh, to resolve them. So overall, while I am not particularly pleased with what I see before me. The fact is, we are moving in the right direction, in my estimation. Dr. Jameson? Uh, Florence Jameson. Uh, I agree, I'm glad we're finding some of the other uh, issues, and then it will also help us in the future to avoid perhaps the same thing. And that's where uh, what I was leading up to in our last discussion at our last board meeting on reconciliation, we had brought up, you know, as we move forward, trying to avoid making some of the mistakes. And one of the big problems that was repeating uh, had to do with um, when they don't pay the right amount and then they're carried over and they continue to be carried over. And then... Uh, they're not getting their benefits. Whether well, they're getting their benefits, but uh, it gets it got to be very uh, tangled up and confusing about when you actually send them their termination notice. And uh, somebody was going to look into the rules uh, that we would expect ourselves be the various participants, the different insurance companies that were that were pretty much. Uh, set out by the federal reg federal regs on all of this, and I wondered if you'd found out w what those rules are, the key ones that affect this, the biggest problem we were having. Yes, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jamison. Bruce Gilbert, for the record. I think it's important at the outset that we separate uh, things here. On a going forward basis, this will not be a problem because billings and collections and the extension of coverage and terminations will all be handled directly by the carriers. So you will not see a repeat of these sorts of issues. The problem arose when payments were received and either were not credited or were not properly credited or conflicting information or data was provided to carriers. And that's really the genesis of this problem. 
So, so it is a problem that we see only in the rearview mirror. On a going forward basis, it is not going to be an issue uh, for the exchange or for Nevada consumers. That, that being said, we have been actively involved and in working with the carriers on resolving issues regarding the terminations, as you, as you brought up. There have been a number of different strategies that have been put forward. There have been and continue to be discussions about that. There are financial impacts that have to be taken into account uh, by the carriers, um, including uh, potential premium tax liability, including uh, the requirements uh, under federal law for handling uh, the termination of APTC folks and non-APTC folks. So it's a, it's a, it's a fairly convoluted issue. And I, I would love to be able to tell you it's easy and, and yeah, there's a bright line law or rule or regulation that has been promulgated by CMS or, or someone else. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, and, and Scott knows this from our discussions, this is, this is a one-year issue and it's an issue that, that we are still grappling with to some degree. Does, well, does that I, answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes and no. Okay. So uh, I thought we were going to be able, though, to just have some uh, general rules that do apply and let us know what they are, because no one could really quite clearly, so that even the carriers, although they're collecting now, which is great and will eliminate a huge part of the problem, uh, what exactly, whether it's uh, a plan that's got an APTC or a plan that doesn't, there must be general uh, rules and nobody could quite tell us what they were last time of when you can actually terminate that client when they fail to pay their full payment. There must be some basic ones, although I'm sure there's a lot of exceptions, because we wanted to make sure that going forward, those patients that are having those problems, that somehow on their statement or some other way, it's clarified to them that if you're paying 80% and not 100%, your plan will no longer will be null and not effective this month or six, 30 days later or 60 days. We, we were going to get a little feedback on just the basics. I know there's going to be a lot of exceptions, um, how we were going to deal, what it was and how we would deal with it. Yeah, for the, for the record, Bruce Gilbert. And, bam. Um, and Damon actually will go through the rules that don't deal with partial payments. I'll deal with the partial payment aspect. And what I would tell you is this, if you went through the federal exchange, for example, last year, what they will tell you is it's up to the carrier. The carrier sets the rules essentially for when coverage attaches, that is you have to make your payment, and then if you don't make your full payment or if you make partial payments or you fall behind, that's governed, that's governed by the, by the, the carrier's uh, uh, processes and procedures essentially. Um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit different than what we're dealing with here. Um, when, it comes to, when it comes to simply paying or not paying, Damon will go through that with you, and that, that's simple. But when you're asking about what happens when there are partial payments, that's really, that's really a carrier issue. Um, and they may accept payment, they may reject payment, but if you look on healthcare.gov, for example, it will tell you specifically that that's a carrier-directed activity and that they don't provide that information because it will vary from state to state, obviously, and from carrier to carrier. Does that help? Well, to an extent, but then each of our main carriers has got to be very clear somewhere for these, this population of people that don't quite understand its consequences and if they have that particular product, that this carrier may not be lenient and an, and an incomplete payment means you will not get insurance or another carrier may roll it over one more month and you continue to get your coverage. But if that's the case, I think we need to really make sure that each person for their respective um, plan with their carrier understands the consequences of their actions. Yeah, this uh, is Lynn. Uh, th may, I, may I ask a follow-up, though, on this? Is it the carriers that each get to decide, or is this a state, or are there division of insurance rules that they all must follow? I mean, it sounds, I, I, I'm, I, I'm one. And, and along that same before you answer, because before we were told, because this was, you know, the program we're in, the exchange of the federal government was involved, the, the carriers had to respect, at least on, if no payment was made, a, a certain extended 90 days mm -hmm. as opposed to their usual 
30 days or 10 days. And I'm surprised there's a difference for a partial payment. And then if you add that to your response to Lynn's, thanks. And uh, move on to the record. And I thought that we were also told that if the person short paid one month and then they short paid the next month, they made up the difference. I thought that there was some discussion so about that one month. for the previous month. So they weren't you know. really three months partially so behind they were, when we, right, one they, month fully paid and two months partially behind yeah, and then when yeah. you really terminate. Right. So, Mr. Kipper or Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> I, I, I think I have this uh, for the record, Scott Kipper. I, I think the answer to this question is, is there's twofold. One, there's certainly hard and fast rules under uh, the insurance code in, 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 insur in, in the, in a, the insur NAC as to the, the, where the floor is or where the ceiling is as to how a uh, a carrier must react and how he must treat consumers. So you have a, an absolute minimum amount of time that uh, they can they must provide a uh, a uh, uh, a period for which the consumer must be notified and then uh, they have an opportunity to uh, terminate that coverage at the end of that period. But there is no hard and fast rule that says the carrier must terminate if these options are not met. In other words, the carrier can extend further time to each individual as they see fit, uh, in, which I think is very good for consumers because if a consumer, for instance, is in their uh, grace period and they go through their grace period and then they make a payment uh, three or four days after that is over, uh, the, the carrier may accept that great, uh, payment and continue the coverage, even though technically they would have been able to terminate their coverage. So, uh, yeah, there's a floor in there, but there's no hard and fast rules if they go beyond that. And and so I hope I've answered the question that uh, there is no uh, hard and fast rules the carriers must meet if they go beyond that grace period. Well, uh, I don't feel the question's been answered yet because at some point, each one of our carriers, just like for our own liability, uh, medical coverage, I'm, I know almost regardless if it's medical or homeowners or whatever, there's a they, they tell me what my grace period is. And then let me tell you if I'm 24 hours later, I've lost my house insurance, my auto insurance, or my health insurance. So our, our clients need to know for each carrier what their grace period is, whatever they decide to set it at, as gracious as they are. It's for the record, Scott Kipper, and, and I, I believe that that is in the, in the contract of insurance that that consumer receives, uh, but there is uh, no absolutes that say if you exceed that grace period by even one minute that your coverage is terminated. If the carrier decides they will accept that payment two days or three days or five days later, then that then that coverage is continued. And it is not hard and fast rule that says your coverage is terminated just because you've not paid within the grace period. Yeah, and, and Bruce Gilbert, for the record, uh, I think the question that's been posed, though, is a little bit different, which is, for example, your insurance carrier sends you a bill for $100 and you send them 70 bucks. Okay, what options, if any, do, does the carrier have in that situation? And my understanding is they can accept the $70 and, and give you additional time, or they can find that it is not an acceptable payment of premium and return it to you. That is correct. And that is on a case-by-case. That's on a case-by-case -case basis. So, so this is Lynn. So I think Dr. Jameson is is asking then, is there going to be a little any, anything that we can provide that's a little bit clearer information for people as they select? Or is the answer that it just comes within whichever health plan or health insurance company somebody contracts with, it's in that document and that uh, it, it's in that contract that they're signing, that it tells you what the grace period is again, but I think that's for full payment is there something disclosed that we haven't seen for partial payment and how that works? It just, it just, I think, I think we're asking these questions because there's so many exactly. that were partial. I don't think we would be asking these questions if it was a hundred people or 500 people. It's so many people that are making partial payments 
And again, as we talked about, this might be because we have a new population of people who are now getting health insurance, they're lower income, they are they are getting subsidized federally, or or there was confusion at the outset because their tax credit was miscalculated or what some of those reasons are, but is there a way that those, some of those issues that we seem to have seen a lot, we can kind of head off at the pass before we start the new open enrollment? And I would just add to that because I feel like uh, I couldn't believe that people would do a partial payment and accept they would get it because usually I thought everybody knew if it's partial, you're just not getting it. But clearly, hundreds if not thousands of our patients thought that was, uh, clients thought that was okay. And we kind of set a precedence by not immediately rejecting a partial payment as incomplete. And a lot of them think that it's okay kind of now after the first year. They might have that thought. And I think somewhere... We need to just clearly say that, it, you know, to receive your benefit, if that's what it's going to be, that a full payment must be done. Or, or, or do we? I mean, I don't know. For the record, Scott Kipper. And, and I think that why with, uh, with the billing statement that says your bill is, is X dollars, and it, certainly we all should uh, expect that that is what you would send. Uh, it, if if you send if your bill is a is a hundred and fifty dollars and you send a hundred and thirty, uh, I think it's endemic upon the carrier to say, look, you uh, you didn't pay the full amount, so you need to f submit the twenty dollars in addition to whatever upcoming payments uh, are are coming forward. But I think to set a hard and fast rule. Uh, kind of goes against the grain of the Affordable Care Act. And, 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 and not that I would sit here and defend or, or not defend what our carriers have done, but generally speaking, what we, we've seen is our carriers bending over backwards to attempt to facilitate enrollment yes. and to continue enrollment. Uh, and, and I would put this back on the carriers to say, you need to... Uh, uh, attempt to help those consumers out who uh, e either on purpose or inadvertently have not paid the full amount that you're required to pay to continue your coverage. Uh, so I would encourage us to say this is probably more of a, an issue for our carriers rather than a board decision to say if you've not paid your premium completely, this is what must happen. Yes, and uh, Bruce Gilbert, for the record, if I may, you know, this is a situation that the carriers already handle with off-exchange policies. So they already have a process in place. They already have internal policies in place. And this is something that they already deal with and deal with successfully. You know, as, as Dr. Jamison has pointed out, there are a number of factors that lead to this being a problem for us. But those factors are of, of our own making. That's not because the consumers had a problem. It's because... We didn't act quickly enough, and we didn't take care of things when we needed to. But the process that the carriers have and have had has worked to this point in time. All we're doing is taking that already established process and those policies and procedures and saying everybody's going to be treated the same, including those who sign up through the exchange. So that's, 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 that's really it. This is Lynn. I, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but I think that I, I think just going back to the issue of this is a whole new pool of people who might who, who maybe we because of the confusion and maybe we can educate a little bit more and a little bit clearer. And maybe the message is that you need to pay your full premium. I mean, maybe maybe the message is you shouldn't, you know, you, you shouldn't pay 50 percent of your premium because there is a likelihood that you will get canceled. I don't know. I just wonder if there's an education component to this that we can help with either on the website or as people are filling out their application. So I just kind of toss out that that's as a that's, as, that's I think that's the point. Unless these percentages are normal throughout the industry. And I have no idea. If, if these percentages of partial payments are really common, then then we probably can end the discussion. If the percentage of partial payments are significantly higher for this group of people who are on the exchange than in than in off the exchange, then I do think we need to help educate a little bit better. And I guess my follow-up question to that is, 
the 3,900 consumers as of September 30th that are short pay recurring, that have short pay problems, are those, do those people have current coverage or would you say those people do not have current coverage? And are those people in the, and are the, are, are all of those folks, the 5,367, are they in our 32,000 number that Carrie reported in the last agenda item? What do we think of these 5,000 people or four to 5,000 people? Do we think of them as people with insurance coverage or do we think of them as people that do not have insurance coverage? Uh, for the record, Bruce Gilbert, and to be frank, it's going to depend on the actions of the carrier. There are carriers who terminated people uh, when they didn't pay their bill, and there are other carriers that did not, awaiting additional information from the exchange. So who falls into which of these categories? I cannot tell you. I do not know. But what I will say is, uh, more probably than not, this, this issue will be resolved within the next, resolved is probably too strong a word, let me take that back. <laughs> uh, th this issue will be dealt with in some way, shape or form over the course of the next 60 days or so um, uh, as we uh, move through our discussions with carriers on how to deal with these particular problems. But each carrier has acted differently. And so it's, it's all but impossible for me to sit here and say, these are people who have insurance uh, and are being carried on the active roles, or these are people who are not, because I don't have that information. Well, this would be my last question. Just back to the rules. So uh, was it a little confusing then? Because if the federal government said if someone failed to make a payment, they couldn't terminate for 90 days. So is that kind of what caused a problem? Because then a couple of them would would make partial payments and they would include partial payments from two months and then that made one full month so then it wasn't 90 days it was down to 60 and it just kept going on and maybe that's why this kept dragging out I, I think Bruce Gilbert for the record I think that that's a, a very incisive uh, a view you know when you make a mistake the, the best thing to do is to fix it promptly and if you don't fix it promptly it tends to cascade and I think that that is, to some degree, what what we're struggling with now is that. Well, the is reason, that, I'm sorry. Well, the reason I mention it is, will our regular insurance carriers be faced with that kind of issue with the 90-day rule also, and the partial payments? Will they kind of end up with that same little quandary? You know. For the record, Scott Kipper and Dr. Jameson, you 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 kind of took the words out of my mouth in in that. Uh, uh, I think it's endemic upon us to find out what is the cause of the short pay. Is it because uh, of the issue that you just brought up with the 30 versus 90 day? Is it uh, uh, an erroneous uh, uh, determination of what the APTC uh, possibly was so that, that the consumer was paying the wrong amount uh, and relying upon some other type of, uh, uh, of information. So it, it, it could be a, a variety of things. I would just hate us to create a rule that uh, uh, disenfranchises a consumer because they're trying to do the right thing. Yeah, I don't think we want to create any kind of rule. We're just trying to understand the rules that are out there that the clients may be subject to, whether they're different for each carrier or not and what the big overriding picture is on the effect of partial payments towards their 90-day termination, when it begins, when it ends, et cetera. I'm, I'm reminded of a movie called, uh, uh, it's an old movie called Bang the Drum Slowly, where it was a baseball movie, uh, and these group of ball players would play a card game, and they, they called it Teguar, which is, stands for the greatest game without any rules. Um, and I think that we kind of in a game of Teguar here, uh, on these issues, but as the staff continues to work through this, and, and certainly the division uh, is 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 doing their best to to make sure that 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 uh, we do what we need to do as well to provide that that type of assistance to consumers as well as to carriers to understand the the uh, outcomes here. Well, we'll look forward to the follow up on how our various insurance companies are going to deal with the partial payment of the 90 days. Are there any other questions um, for Mr. Gilbert on the agenda item eight? No. 
Not seeing any, we will close agenda item eight and move towards agenda item nine, discussion and possible action items for dates, times, uh, and for future meetings. I think our next meeting is scheduled for November 13th. Um, are there any agenda items that any of the board members would like on the agenda? I'm going to see an update on the reconciliation. All right. Uh, if we can have an update on the reconciliation <laughs> process, that'd be great. I have two requests. One is that I assume we're not going to have any um, more consumer subcommittee, consumer assistance subcommittee meetings. And if starting from November through February, we can have a more detailed consumer assistance report um, regarding outreach and, um, and marketing, kind of, I, I think, probably more like what we were doing um, last uh, open enrollment. Um, so I think there's just a lot of questions and we'd like a little bit more detail um, for the board in those reports. So if we can add that as an agenda item. And I would also like a legislative update on any um, proposed legislation for the um, upcoming legislative session that's gonna affect the um, health insurance exchange. So Mr. Gilbert, if you can work on that and if we can have that as an agenda item, I'd appreciate that. And anything else from board members? With that, we will close agenda item nine and move to agenda item 10, public comment. We have one in Las Vegas. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick Cassell and I'm a broker. You know, it's an interesting question. In 25 years of writing health insurance, I've never written a policy before where a carrier would accept it with a policy premium being shorted. It's never happened. Okay, a, a billing period can go, and maybe somebody mails it a check for $100, and it should be $100.90. They'll bill them the 90 cents going forward. But for the record, it has never happened before. This is a unique situation. However, the numerous questions that I've been posed with from my clients that are on the exchange or are pending at 3900 is simple. Why should I pay for something I haven't received? That's the biggest issue. I have, a, I have numerous clients that will come to me and say, they're asking me to come up with 1200 bucks at one time or $2,700 on one time. This is supposed to be for people who have very little income and they're going to have to come up with 2700 at one time for services that were never rendered. They could go to a doctor and the doctor said, I can't see you because you don't have insurance. So how can we ask the consumer to pay for something they haven't received or they have, they have no access to? That's been the biggest problem. I also have numerous clients that have made payments, premium pay payments to the exchange and actually overpaid. I've seen their statements and I've seen how much they paid and they're still not reconciled and they're being told they owe more money. I, to this point, here it is, it's almost a year, how could that possibly happen? I also have a, la a lady right now in Pahrump who's still not insured and the letter she wrote me was basically, if anything happens to me, my husband knows to call you because she has a major problem with aneurysms, okay, and she can't get a medication. She's still not in the system and we receive an email from the exchange saying, we have no record of this lady or, or the information you're giving us isn't there. Yet I have every email to board members as well as the governor's office, et cetera. I have the whole law of chronology. How can these people still be floating around out there? It doesn't make any sense. And from a, from a processing side, when you're dealing off exchange, within 48 hours, I can have everything rectified. How can it take 48 days, six months, and almost a year to rectify it? I mean, that's my problem. Now, going forward, I think 75% of the problems will be handled with direct billing. And you won't have that problem, Dr. Jamison, because people are going to pay their premium. I, for one, speaking for the brokers that I know here, none of us have ever did a policy right. and never collected the actual premium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. You can't. You just don't process an application without the money. That's what we thought. So I'm sitting here answering that. I, I, I sat there. I was biting my tongue because it's like it doesn't happen. Now, there have been problems with the APTC, which kicked back, and I understand that part. But... People have made payments, premiums for numerous months. One gentleman I'm dealing with right now, his problem is he doesn't want to pay for four months ago because it, it took him four months to finally get him in the system. I don't blame him. That really is the issue that needs to be addressed. How can we fix that? And, and to say it's on the carriers, we expect the carriers to pay claims with no money. It gets ridiculous. There's a, there's a catch-22 here. So when you look at that, and what I'm sitting here listening to, it's scary to say, well, it's on the carriers. 
I, I picked up a payment on the corner of Bonanza and Pecos, a money order, from a lady who went to a check cashing place and got a loan to make a premium payment. She was called three weeks ago and told her her insurance was in effect. When I called the carrier, the carrier says her insurance is not in effect and it terminated back in February. This payment was received three week, uh, five weeks ago when, when I picked up the payment and handed it off here. I, I don't understand how this lady doesn't have insurance. And her, her words to me, I have no faith in the system. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment down in Las Vegas? Any public comment in the north? With that, we will close um, public comment. Um, can, can, can we have, uh, we'll have, can you stay after? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And all right, I'm gonna, Mr. Gilbert, if we can have you talk to Mr. Casal in some fashion. Uh, I'm happy to talk to Pat, never a problem. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, with that, I think we are adjourned for the day, and we'll see everyone in November. Thank you. Right before Thanksgiving. Yeah. Right before the whole Two days before.